yeah, just see that everyone's in the room who wants to join. Um, yeah, our next speaker is uh, Charles. Uh, he's executive director at Policy Lab Africa and advocates for the right to repair movement in Nigeria. Yeah, thank you very much for the for the introduction. And uh, yeah, um, my name is Charles. And, uh, as Catherine said, um, I'm the co-founder of Policy Lab Africa, based in Lagos, Nigeria. And uh, I wanted to share with you all uh, the work we are doing here in Nigeria on right to repair and other um, initiatives, uh, you know, related uh, to this. Um, so let's uh, get into it. So, um, I mean, we started out, uh, you know, coming out from the COVID, um, we had um, a, a lot of uh, issues related to, you know, repair and, uh, you know, locating where you, uh, many people had their devices kind of, um, um, you know, spoiled or broken, you know, during the lockdown. And uh, so there was a lot of agitation in terms of people going to, because the, the stores where you normally repair stuff, if you can see here, this is, uh, one of the largest uh, computer market in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, and this is where people usually come to kind of uh, fix their phones, their laptops and other you know, devices. You know, but due to the lockdown, people cannot access this market. So, I mean, so during that lockdown, we kind of started to put data together to kind of uh, uh, make it open so that uh, people can um, get their devices fixed at their home or they take it to that place where it will be repaired. So, I mean, but from my own personal experience, I've lived in Europe for, for over 13 years and uh, I've seen right to repair movement, you know, firsthand uh, in Italy and uh, as well as uh, in, in Germany. So, so this has been something I wanted to, you know, drive, you know, coming back to Nigeria. And that led us to, first of all, we made an open data where people can locate, you know, repair shops and, uh, you know, like that. And we just put it there on Google and, uh, you know, our interaction with a lot of these technicians and, uh, you know, repairers, you know, led us to something, you know, I don't know if I'm, if I'm allowed to name check, you know, brands, you know, but we kind of uh, started talking to people that are into repair and they tell us how difficult it was to kind of assess um, many of the big brands, smartphones and laptops to assess their spare parts, which is really, really, um, expensive and even scarce. So many times they will have to order these uh, spare parts from either the US or the UK. So that let us led us to um, to kind of start the right to repair, you know, advocacy in Nigeria. So uh, I think that the problem for us in Nigeria is is clear. Uh, Nigeria is very very big. Um, you know, estimated 200 million people. Um, we have over 90 million internet-enabled devices. And uh, we have a strong use and dispose culture here. Um, everything is kind of sacchetized. And I mean, it's not too far-fetched. Um, we have over 80 million people living on less than $2 per day. And so, um, so the idea to kind of buy things cheap and dispose later is kind of, you know, imbibed, you know, coming in from the 90s. Um, that became, you know, kind of our of our culture. Then, because of the economic, um, you know, situation for of many of us, um, I mean, there are cheap OEM devices mainly coming from China and Asia. I mean, in Nigeria, you could find um, one of the rarest brand 
of a smartphone you've ever had before. You can buy it for like $30, $50, but it doesn't last more than you know, six months, I can assure you. So we have cheap OEM devices and this place has become like a dumping site you know, for, for e-waste. Um, many of these you know, cheap smartphone, um, you know, portable devices, laptops, um, they don't last, they don't have um, you know, spare parts, no repair information. Um, their, their, their device schematics is quite you know, different you know, from the usual, you know, device that, you know, repairers know how to fix because they understand already how the schematics, you know, you know, works. So it's very difficult. So people will have to kind of dispose them and buy another one. So these are the problems we kind of um, undercovered and started to articulate it to see how we can move the right to repair movement in the right direction. And that led us to, to this. So, so for our advocacy, what we wanted to do First of all, is to be able to, you know, create an awareness, you know. Um, um, so we have to be able to kind of put out messages about the, the dangers of e-waste, the environmental impact, the economic impact, and the social impact, you know, of repair. And then we started to engage, you know, policymakers and manufacturers. Um, uh, the idea also was to create evidence on the value of repair, uh, you know, and maintenance as a social, economic, and environmental necessity. I, I think that um, African societies, especially Nigeria, used to be very crafty and artisanal, you know. But uh, you know, the gig economy um, is making everybody to kind of lose, you know, those values of kind of maintaining our houses, maintaining our cars, and and stuff like that, which is not supposed to be that way. So we wanted to be able to create that evidence, you know, through research and also, you know, engagement with experts to be able to create knowledge around this area. And so we articulated these goals and say, okay, this is how we are going to kind of, you know, build our advocacy here in Nigeria. So, um, so this hybrid, um, you know, model that we kind of developed in, in terms of we want to be able to talk to, you know, policymakers and uh, we want to be able to engage them through events and uh, also kind of citizens, uh, other stakeholders involved. We're also using social media very much more to be able to kind of, uh, you know, put out messages, you know, that are kind of, you know, um, reach to people easier and as well as address other issues related to citizens. I think. Uh, this is the way we kind of said, okay, um, let's go this way. Um, we are not asking for too much. In terms of, we kind of articulated um, a policy brief. And in our policy brief, what we are kind of uh, asking for, uh, you know, the policymaker is to be able to kind of, uh, you know, provide a guideline and the legislation that allows, um, you know, mobile phone owners to be able to unlock their phones. I think that um, for personally, let me tell you, I come from a middle class, right? And uh, 80 million people in poverty. And the only way a middle class citizen of Nigeria can afford an iPhone 3 is that you buy a UK used phone. That UK used phone is used in the UK. We call it UK used, right? So it is usually like SIM locked, right? So maybe it is uh, locked by T-Mobile or Vodafone, right? And so they kind of bring it to Nigeria. And when you bring it to Nigeria, they now do a hard reset on the phone, you know, using a software. That hard reset will be able to wipe out everything. And then it becomes a kind of brand new iPhone and it sells cheaper right and that is what most uh, people that are using um, these phones in nigeria use so we can allow um this kind of unlocking to i don't think there's anything wrong with um with uh, um having you know uk used phones especially for iphones and maybe google pixel and some other brands coming here um yeah but the idea is that many of them are not accessible many of them can, may not be open and sometimes they get you know faulty you know, allowing unlocking is kind of um, a big deal, you know, for us here. Another issue is to make tools and spare parts, you know, readily available. Um, I think that uh, it costs about $200, you know, to fix a Samsung um, screen, Samsung S22 screen. 
or S21 screen here in Nigeria. It is super, super expensive, like, like a quarter of the price of buying a brand new one. It is not available anywhere in kind of the picture of the market I showed you. You can't get it anywhere. You either find it in a Samsung authorized store or a Samsung branded store. So, I mean, it's, it's quite weird because I think that what happens when you don't have um, original, when you create a scarcity, you know, for original spare parts like that, what happens is that um, the market directs itself to be able to go out and buy the imitation one. So you see people in that market, they now go somewhere in Taiwan or in China, and then they now make the fake spare parts of Samsung, and they now sell it cheaper in the market. So this becomes a problem. So when you fix something um, on your Samsung phone, and uh, after three months again, it starts to become a problem. So it's an issue for us. So we are trying to say, mandate many of these big brands from Nokia to Samsung to Apple to be able to make their parts readily kind of available and supplied into that market, you know, that you see, you know, you know, the market is economic, it determines it will make it cheaper because there is a lot of demand and supply, but there is scarcity in the market. So which means it is very, very expensive. You can't even find it most times. They have to kind of order for you. So another thing we started to ask the, the um, you know, the regulators here is to provide, ask the, the manufacturers to provide repair information you know, and kind of review the warranty. Um, I don't think no law in Nigeria kind of, uh, you know, stipulates on warranty for electronic devices, you know, anywhere. Um, everything depends, they give a lot of, there's a lot of power on the manufacturer or the seller, you know. Um, so there is nothing like a, a refund. Uh, many of these warranty clauses are not kind of enforced. It is not debatable. I haven't seen anywhere. Um, people kind of, you know, get along with it. And uh, it's come on for far too long. And we are saying kind of, no, we want to be able to make sure that there is a, 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 a social contract between us and those manufacturers. So this is what we articulated. And we started putting it into briefs and started to engage, um, you know, the Nigerian Technology Development Agency and, uh, you know, Nigerian Consumer Protection Council. And uh, yeah, I mean, they like the idea, you know, but the regulatory environment in Nigeria is a lot. I mean, it's not like there are too many things that our regulators want to focus on that are kind of priority. I believe that, you know, um, that repair and right to repair is kind of a priority because of the, the benefits it provides in these three areas, which is environmental, social, and economic. Um, you know, but they are kind of snailing, um, slowing the, the, the process down, um, we haven't been able to kind of uh, engage meaningfully. And, uh, and that, you know, is, is, is a worry for, for us. Um, but, but it's not a problem. The, the, one, of, one of the things we kind of thought about is that we thought that, you know, from, from, from theory, I kind of uh, dig deep um, reading, you know, randomly and kind of think that, you know, place identity is, you know, is one of the ways to kind of explain, you know, cultural and environmental constraints, you know, surrounding consumption. You know, people are kind of identified with their locality, their communities, they are so bounded, you know, by it. And the behavior in there, you know, kind of moves along. So we kind of said, we want to be able to draw attention, you know, but engaging policymakers might not make impact you know, in the short and medium term, but in the long term it will. But what do we do to be able to kind of, you know, draw attention of people? So we have to come up with initiatives and that led us to be able to come up with a gifted hands program. Um, so this gifted hands program is a training program that is training, um, you know, repair technicians, mainly focused on girls, you know, between the ages of 15 and 30. And what we wanted to do is we want to be able to put them in a room, train them for about 10 weeks. Um, and then they learn how to be able to fix all models of smartphones. We started to focus on smartphones. After that 10 weeks, they get a certificate. Then they go into, um, into the world. Um, half of them will go get internships. We kind of secured that for them. Many of them set up their own small repair businesses from their houses. Um, some of them have gone on to kind of uh, train um, in other areas like laptops to be able to have a wide range of this thing. But first of all, they are earning money. The economic benefit is there. 80% of our students um, have been able to kind of uh, get 
earn money through directly through um, being employed in the repair industry. And we're happy for that. And then you look at the social benefits. We kind of every, um, as they kind of go through their training, we kind of uh, have a community repair program whereby they show their skills. They go into the community, we put up a banner and then we ask the community to bring their devices and we fix it for free. So they learn to solve problems, learn to be able to manage the business side and kind of you know, consult and diagnose problems you know, like that. Um, also the environmental, we want to be able to build ambassadors you know, that can be able to take the world of right to repair out for us. You know, um, we are alone. We are the only um, organization campaigning for right to repair in Nigeria. There are others that are in the conversation, you know, to kind of, you know, join us. Nigeria is a, it's so big, a country of 200 million people. So our voice is like a drop in the ocean. We need more ambassadors to be able to kind of, you know, take on the world. And that is why we started to, you know, create these young girls to be able to be ambassadors of repair for us. And uh, so far, um, we started this training um, in March this year. And so far, we have trained 90 young girls that are repair technicians. Over 70 of them are gainfully employed in the repair industry. And these are coming from uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods, the slums that are, you can find in Lagos. The program is free of charge. I mean, thanks to a lot of people that saw our tweets and kind of, you know, helped us. Um, we got free repair kits from iFixit to be able to run the program. Um, a lot of donations as well, you know, coming from, from abroad. So, uh, I mean, this is our journey and we feel like I couldn't be proud of what we are doing and what we're about to do, um, you know, over, over the next year. Um, we are still engaging with regulators and kind of uh, doing a lot of, uh, a lot of awareness with different initiatives um, all around the country. Um, so moving forward, um, I think that um, I was having a conversation um, because um, I think that our environment is kind of different from where you find out in Europe or, or in the US or anywhere across the world. I think that if you want to kind of influence you know, policy, legislation, regulation in Nigeria, um, your voice has to be very loud and there has to be some form of um, external influence, you know, for example, you know, if, uh, if there is a protest in Nigeria now and somehow Obama tweeted about the protest, then the government will pay attention, right? <laughs> so, so that is what happens. So with this program that we kind of, with the Gifted Hands training program that we try to uh, run in Nigeria, um, we've had a lot of support from international NGOs, a lot of support from local NGOs. Um, many of them have been in conversation to see how we can be able to drive this program because of the economic and environmental benefit to be able to drive it, you know, towards different parts of the country, you know, which is, you know, very, you know, impressive and, uh, and, uh, and encouraging. Um, you know, one of the uh, INGOs that called me, uh, I mean, Norwegian Refugee Council, and they said that, um, that this you know, reminds them of something they did a few years ago, which kind of you know, connects people and the way um, um, our program kind of um, you know, empowers people to be able to kind of um, learn a skill and therefore use it to be able to earn on a daily. And these are people that have no educational background opportunities to kind of advance the education. And uh, also being able to kind of make profits you know, for, if we kind of, um, um, want to write to pay and do it very well. There is a lot of profit also for all the stakeholders involved, especially the manufacturers and also the planet. We think that, um, you know, removing a lot of, you know, devices they are supposed to find its way to the landfill, removing them and fixing them and giving them to people that are disadvantaged, it connects everybody. And, and that is one thing we're kind of, uh, you know, driving, you know, to do. As we, as we go into, 2023, um, our agenda is to kind of continue to engage, you know, high level events, workshops, um, training, you know, putting out articles and, and looking for, you know, strategic partnerships anywhere, you know, they might be around the world. I mean, I'm talking to, to, to you guys uh, in, uh, in, in Brussels, Belgium. Um, we are very open to partner uh, with people to be able to kind of advance our, our initiative. 
Um, my hope here is that I'm able to learn from everybody uh, during this fixed fest and be able to learn, um, you know, strategies for advocacy and engagement. I mean, that is something we want to be able, that is why I want to share our story. So if you have any advice, if you have any tips, if you have anything to share, we are here to also learn and we are kind of, uh, you know, taking notes about how this is happening and taking place around the world. You know, we are motivated by the movement and, uh, and people that are doing it all over the world. And we thank everybody that has, you know, supported us, you know, through this journey. And uh, I think uh, that is it. Thank you very much for, for listening to, to my talk. And I, I'll be here if you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Charles. I think, uh, yeah, we have a lot to learn <laughs> from you. That was very, uh, uh, yeah, it seems to be an amazing program you have uh, installed. And I think that's something that uh, really can, uh, should be, should be uh, multiplied in many different areas and um, spaces. Uh, yeah, there are already some questions, I think. Ah, yeah. Uh, do you have social media or some online space where we can follow the program? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We have a website. We have social media um, account. We're on Twitter. Can you put it in the chat so we can check it yeah, out? I will. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat now. Um, uh, Janet posted a question in the chat, Charles. Did you see it? So, yeah, I'm reading it um, uh, regarding the negative images uh, we see here in, in Western media of um, yeah, West Africa. How can you link with the agenda for creating national regulation for e-waste in a way that respects people and jobs? Could repair and reuse be linked up with this agenda to deal with e-waste? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, can I talk to that? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um. I mean, thank you very much, um, Janet. Um. Uh, yeah. I think that. I mean, you are. You are. You are very much right. I think there. There is. Um. There is this. Um. Kind of. You know. Dichotomy between. Um. What. Um, repair and reuse is all about. I, I think that a lot of people kind of get it wrong when um, we say that, you know, Africa is a dumping site, right? Where you have all devices, you know, coming, you know, to be kind of reused. Uh, I mean, many of them have already kind of reached the, the, the end shelf of their, of their life, right? You know, um, yeah, but, but I think that on one end, we want to be able to create um, I mean, not only, um, I think that regulation is, is one aspect of, you know, enabling, you know, repair and, you know, reuse. And this also kind of, you know, gets involved. I mean, we manufacture very little. We contribute about 3% to, um, to, the, to the manufacturing thing. So many of the things we use here are kind of imported. So, I mean, so whether you like it or not, if you don't want to be able to, if you want to remove waste from your landfill, you have to repair. It is a necessity, you know, because we don't manufacture a lot and we don't even have um, the capacity to be able to kind of, you know, recycle. So the regulation for e-waste is very important. I think that it's becoming very important, you know, with the, with the COP26 and COP27. I think that a lot of us are kind of thinking, government is thinking um, um, alongside the energy and the environment and stuff like that, of which to repair and reuse also comes, you know, along that value chain. Um, but apart from that, I think that a lot of industry initiatives, you know, helps to be able to kind of encourage the repair industry. You know, for example, if there is no licensed, um, if there is no licensed Apple um, repair, spare parts and the information available here, um, we will always continue to kind of run in circles. And this applies to various other electronic, you know, equipment. Uh, you, you have um, electronic devices that are kind of, you know, imported into the country but no one knows how to use it. No one knows how to repair it. I mean, this happens a lot. Um, I think uh, you guys are in a city where by, I think many 
um, kind of uh, used items, you know, are, are called, I mean, we nicknamed them Belgian. You know, you have Belgian cars, Belgian phone, um, Belgian rugs. So Belgian is kind of um, like a nickname that we give to things that are used, that are secondhand used, you know, over here. But many of them come into Nigeria, but there is no way to kind of fix them. It's not wrong to be able to bring those things, to be able to be reused. I don't think there's anything wrong with them, with it. But what I think is that there is no kind of both regulation and the industry um, initiative to be able to kind of recycle or reuse or repair stuff. So which means that sooner, you know, rather than later, many of these things kind of ends up in landfills you know, as e-waste and they are not disposed properly because we don't have the capacity to even recycle. So there needs to be, so our, our, so our ask and what we, I think we are doing is to be able to not only kind of, you know, drive regulation along this line, but also to help to kind of create an industry, you know, that is striving for repair. So if we can bring all this information, what we want to do to be able to create a database where you find all type of things and you can go there and repair them with videos, um, with to-dos, and you can be able to fix them. So, so if you bring in something like um, a Bosch, um, second-handed use Bosch um, um, washing, washing machine, right? You can be able to fix it because you can be able to go to a platform and get information on how to fix it or be able to find a relative, a relative kind of structure or schematics, you know, many of them have similar kind of schematics in terms of their hardware, but many of our technicians do not know that. And we are the experts are the people that will be able to say, okay, um, this looks, this engine looks just similar like this one. And of course, if you go, if this one is not available in the market, you can be able to buy this spare part and be able to fix it. So those are the kind of initiatives are things that goes along with regulation as well. Elias has a question. Non, en fait, euh, je, je, je n'ai pas de question, mais c'est pour renchérir l'intervention de, 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 de Charles. En fait, euh, Janet souhaite, voudrait voir comment on peut l'avènement d'une réglementation contre les déchets électroniques et, et, et autres. Oui, en fait, euh, l'importation de de ces équipements électroniques euh, en eux-mêmes n'est le, 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 pas une mauvaise chose. Ça, ça, ça nous sert parce qu'on en profite. Nos étudiants, nos écoles, certaines de nos administrations aussi achètent en fait euh, du matériel usagé. Ouais, vous, on n'achète pas toujours le neuf, encore que le neuf est très cher. Donc, pour permettre de réduire quand même euh, le gouffre numérique, ce, ces matériels que nous importons là aussi nous aident nous aide à acquérir euh, du matériel électronique pour réduire ce, fo ce fossé-là. Donc, euh, pour la réglementation, en tout cas, pour, dans le contexte du Bénin, ce n'est pas euh, une préoccupation, une grande préoccupation pour, pour les autorités. Et Charles l'a dit, l'une des premières choses à faire, c'est de populariser, de démocratiser euh, la réparation. Hein? Faire, 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 faire des émissions sur la réparation, mettre à la disposition de la population dans nos langues euh, des manuels de réparation, faire des vidéos sur la réparation comme cela se fait euh, ailleurs avec iPicit par exemple, où on fait des, des vidéos, des manuels de réparation et tout le reste, mettre tout ceci à la disposition de nos jeunes gens, parce que cela aussi, ça ouvre une opportunité, voyez-vous, ça permet de créer de l'emploi et qui sait qui connaît l'Afrique aujourd'hui, l'Afrique de l'Ouest aujourd'hui, il y a beaucoup de problèmes de chômage. Donc, on peut utiliser cela comme une opportunité pour créer de l'emploi à nos jeunes. Il faut aussi rappeler que ces déchets électroniques ne sont pas tout le temps importés. Nous-mêmes, nous créons des déchets électroniques. Le matériel neuf que nous achetons aujourd'hui devient un beau jour un déchet. Qu'est-ce qu'on en fait dans ces cas-là? Ouais, vous. Donc, en attendant d'avoir une réglementation pour ce secteur-là, il faut travailler à apprendre à réparer. Il faut travailler à instaurer une industrie de réparation autour de ces équipements qui sont, qui sont importés là, qui quand même nous rendent service aussi. Ouais, vous. 
Donc, c'est, c'est ce que je pense. Hein. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, nous n'avons pas du tout les moyens de, de nous aventurer sur le terrain du recyclage. On n'a pas ces moyens-là. Il, faut, il ne faut pas se le cacher. Nous n'avons pas ces moyens-là. Peut-être qu'on peut faire euh, euh, de petits recyclages à travers des objets d'art et autres. Mais véritablement recycler et, et réduire en morceaux ces équipements, extraire les métaux et autres, nous n'avons pas encore ces moyens-là. Et pour en finir avec la réglementation, je ne pense pas que chaque pays pris individuellement puisse résoudre, résoudre le problème. Il faut qu'on y aille en réseau. Hein? Il faut qu'on fasse un plaidoyer sous-régional, hein? qu'on travaille ensemble afin de faire comprendre le bien fondé de l'action à nos autorités afin que d'ici là, une réglementation soit, 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 soit bienvenue. Hein? Merci. Do you have anything to add to that, Charles? Um, yeah, I've been struggling to find the, the caption. Um, yeah, oh, Janet, oh, sorry. Janet uh, <laughs> can help us out. Um, okay. She says, I guess, was saying that Benin and small countries don't yet have recycling industries, but that they will need to work in networks regionally with others able to recycle, but they can repair and reuse. Uh, that's in the reach and they need to promote this. Uh, yeah, and I think what he also said was, um, yeah. yeah, we need to um, democratize repair and yeah, that education is key yeah, and information and formation. Uh, I mean, that's exactly what you're doing with your program. Um, also with regards to high um, uh, chômage rates, <laughs> what's, what's the English term, um, with a lot of uh, jobless people, um, repair is, is a very important uh, solution. Um, also in Benin, I think that's what he was saying. Yeah, recycling doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I echo what uh, what he said earlier. Said I think that um, I think that yes, um, uh, that the recycling is quite um, on that top shelf, you know, of the of the ladder. Um, it doesn't uh, there is uh, it exists uh, the, the existence is really very um, little. I think that uh, uh, our low hanging green fruit. Um, you know, for now is is repair, and that you know help us to be able to get, you know, also um, as many people as possible to be to be involved in the in the entire you know repair movement. Uh, yeah, I support that. I agree. Yeah. So thank you very much, Charles. You also yeah you just put uh, the information on your program and uh, on how to reach you on Twitter in the chat. Uh, so for anyone who's interested, uh, go take a look at that. And then, um, yeah, we should continue with the next um, presenter. Uh, thank you, Charles. Yeah, and, thank uh, you. Thank you, guys.